Jesuit suppression of the Latin mass. You've heard of cancel culture? Did you know cancel culture is alive and well inside the Catholic Church? They've been canceling way before cancel culture was popular. You know, 1969, Cardinal Ottaviani penned with others the Ottaviani intervention, saying, you know, this new mass, the Novus Ordo mass, it's about to come out. We got some issues with it because it doesn't seem to fit with the theology of the Council of Trent. We have some concerns. They were swept aside. The Novus Ordo came in, and here we are in 2021. The Latin Mass has been banned in public at St. Peter's Basilica, and a new video came out. Did you see it? Massimo Fagioli, American Magazine, Jesuit Magazine, saying, look, you know, you can have the Latin Mass, but the problem is, is you can't have the theology of the 16th century. You can't have the theology of the Council of Trent that is the basis, he says, of the traditional Latin mass. You see, the liberal modernists in these secularized Jesuits are admitting what theologians were worried about in the 1960s after Vatican II. And they said, you know, we need to reform and update and modernize the mass and the liturgy. People said, nah, this feels Protestant. Why you got Freemasons and Protestants helping out with the liturgy? We don't like that. You're moving in a project. They said, oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Well, here we are. All these year late, years later, mass attendance down. Priestly vocations down. Belief in the real presence down, 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 down. So we're going to look at that clip today. And we're going to look at the history. I'm going to give a quote that's going to kind of shock you by Cardinal Ratzinger, who becomes Pope Benedict XVI. And also a little bit of history. I'm going to go into the history of Eucharistic prayer too, the fast Eucharistic prayer in the Novus Ordo. That has a little bit of a controversy behind it as well. And before we get started today, I want to ask all of you to pray for a man who was a, a devout Catholic. His name was Eric Talley. He was an officer who was killed in the shooting in Colorado. Um, I don't have all the details on who he was, but I know that his family attended the Fraternity of St. Peter Parish in Littleton, Colorado, a great church. I've been there a few times for the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Uh, maybe also worshipped with the Society of St. Pius X. Anyway, a traditional Catholic man who lost his life. And so um, I hope there's some kind of GoFundMe or fundraising for his family. And if there is, I will definitely let y'all know about it because we do need to help his family. I think he's the father of seven children, Eric Talley. So in our opening today, we are going to pray our, our Father for him and all other victims. And we'll remember the repose of his soul and also mercies and grace for his widowed wife and his children. Oremos. Nomini Patris et Fidei et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater Noster, qui es in Celi, sanctificetur nomen tuum, advenia regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, secut in cielo et in terra. Panem nostrum quotidianum nobis odie, dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, Se libera nos malo. Amen. Fideli manime per misericordium Dei requiescat in pace. Amen. Nomini Patris et Fidii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. And I encourage you especially to pray for those seven precious children that just lost their dad uh, in a ridiculous situation there in Colorado. So pray for them. All right, I'm going to run this clip. I know Eric Talley wouldn't like this clip. May he rest in peace. This is, um, I'm going to have to turn sound on here. Just a short outtake from this video in uh, America. Credit to them. That Latin mass, okay, you cannot have the theology of the 16th century that was at the basis of Latin mass. Uh, 
it, 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 it's a distinction that but he's saying so she's you know she's just nodding like yeah that may yeah mm -hmm, yeah you can't have the theology of the 16th century that's the basis of the latin mass let's run that again saying, real quick you, you can have that latin mass okay you cannot have the theology of the 16th century that was at the basis of latin mass so if, now now let me get this straight jesuits and massimo and lady nodding her head and all that the theology of the 16th century in the Catholic Church was wrong? You can't have that in 2021? Is bad? It's outdated? Is it heretical? That's what I kind of want to know, because if you can't have it anymore, that would mean that it's bad. It, does it lead people away from Jesus? Uh, is, is it have um, the roots of heresy? Does it smack of heresy? What's going on where... He's saying, oh, you, you can have the mass, but you can't have the theology. And see, this shows us, my friends, lex orandi, lex credendi. The law of prayer is the law of faith. Massimo Fagioli, Max Beans, as we like to say in Italian, he is saying the exact same thing as Cardinal Ottaviani. He's saying, you know, that the Latin Mass, it, it projects, it proclaims, it preaches traditional Catholic theology. Original sin, the need for redemption and propitiation. Oh, I bet Fagioli don't like me saying the word propitiation. Um, it has the prayers at the foot of the altar saying, you know, the priests and the servers just coming out of the sacristy, they're not ready to ascend the mountain of God, which is the altar of the Catholic Church. They need to stay at the foot of the altar and say some prayers of preparation. The use of Latin itself is a veil. It's a linguistic iconostasis, you know, in the East. They have these icon screens that separate the altar area from the nave of the people. In the Roman church, we had something similar. It's called a root screen. I love them. We should bring them back. When I was, in a, when I was an Episcopal priest, we had a root screen separating the altar from the nave. It's beautiful, carved in wood, big cross on top. It's called a root screen, not because it's rude, but rood means the cross, a cross screen. But Latin provides a linguistic distance. Why is that important? So people say, well, Marshall, why can't we just have the Latin mass put it in English? We could, but see, English is always changing. I mean, just think about the nonsense we've had in the Novus Ordo. The Lord be with you and also with you. Mm. Now it's in with your spirit. It's always changing. Latin is a dead language. It stays the same. When we say that Christ is consubstantial with the Father, consubstantial is going to have the same meaning in 2021 as it was in the 16th century, in the 9th century, and in the 6th century. You see, in a way, Latin is a force field around the theology when we worship. It's also a reminder that the Latin Mass you know, the Mass is not instituted necessarily to speak to you. You know, people say, well, it doesn't speak to me. It doesn't feed me. Look, the Mass is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ offered to the Father through the Holy Ghost. That's what the Mass is. And the priest, chiefly, is not talking to you, not talking to me. He's chiefly speaking to to God, and it is an abrupt reminder that we are there objectively to witness the eternal sacrifice of the Son to the Father. That is what's going on in the Mass. So the traditional Latin Mass and the way it's set, the way the priest faces with the people, this is kind of cool, y'all will like this. It is the tradition of the church St. John of Damascus says that in Jerusalem, where Christ was crucified on Golgotha, he was crucified facing west. John Damascus says this. Christ was crucified 
facing geographic west on the cross. We, in the liturgy, including the priests, faced east. You'll notice there's a crucifix on the traditional altar. That's because Christ is facing west. We faced east to face him, to stand before him, who is our Savior and our judge. A merciful judge, but a judge nonetheless. We're not in a circle. No. Let me show you something real quick. Let me show you something. Would you look at that? Would you look at it? Just look at it. Would you look at it? Is that right there on the screen? The same religion. Look at 1938. Whoa, I like that. A church in Germany. Augustinian church. Would you look at it? Look at it. 1972. Eh, don't like it as much. 2011. What is this? Circle. It's all about human. It's not about God anymore. It's all about each other. Let's stand in a circle like a bunch of pagans, heathens, around a sacred oak like the old Germans used to do before Boniface came in with his axe and chopped that nonsense down. Look at that. Poor excuse for an altar. It's just a, it's a little Ikea table. It's not even in this. I mean, this is nonsense. And then look at the, look at on the right. What is that? Liquid magma? Looks like the fires of hell. Not some any place I want to be. I don't see the Blessed Virgin Mary, the saints. I don't see Jesus Christ. I don't see the Holy Spirit. I see nothing but chaos and ugliness. Look at 1938 and look at 2011. All right, now, let's just pretend you're an alien. You came off a spaceship and you looked at these pictures. Would you say that's the same religion? Is that the same religion in 1938 that you see in 2011? Same religion worship space but the people in 1938 were approaching the holy trinity in a way that is substantially different than what you see in the picture in 2011 that's a problem well gee taylor i've been to reverend novus order yes you have there are the Unicorn Novus Ordos. I've been saying that for years, but they're rare. 99.9% look more like the 2011 picture and less like the 1938 picture. Why is that? Because the Novus Ordo Mass was designed to appeal to Protestants. They had Protestants work on it, and it was designed by Anibal Bunini, an alleged Freemason whose theology is deeply suspect. So you look at a you look at a picture like this and you think it's not the same thing. And sadly, you go all across the United States, you go across Europe, anywhere where there are churches built before 1950s. And you look at the before and after, and it's just an arrow in the heart. And you have to ask yourself, why is it? I know people want to talk about hermeneutic of continuity, and yeah, we can make the Novus Ordo better, more reverent. But why is it that in 99% of the time, it degraded? They took out the statues. They took out the kneelers. They took out the altars. They took out the altars. I mean, almost every single thing in the churches, when the Novus Ordo came in, they changed it. They changed it. And as we hear Massimo Fagioli saying in the Jesuits at America magazine, that the theology at the basis of the Latin Mass says Massimo. He admits it on YouTube, here on YouTube. The theology 
at the basis of the Latin Mass cannot be accepted in the contemporary, modern, I'm not even going to say the church because that's not the real church. In the Novus Ordo Disneyland, that theology cannot, says Massimo, be accepted. They are doing the Great Reset. You think the Great Reset started last year? The Great Reset started in 1960. When they came into the one true church, they barged in to, to the Ark of Noah and began sledgehammering altar rails. Thanks for the super chat, Stephanie. Sledgehammering, sledgehammering altar rails, putting in little flimsy wooden tables, throwing out the Gregorian chant in the books, telling nuns to wear pants and blouses and to take off their veil and reorganizing the beautiful, the sacred, the traditional and orthodox faith given by Jesus Christ to the apostles. Go to an Eastern or Western church in 1900, 1800, 1500, and see if anywhere in the history of Christianity you see anything that looks like the 2011 picture right there. Do it. Prove me wrong, people. Prove me wrong. Go find a blueprint from a church in the 1200s that looks like the 2011 arrangement. You won't. It's impossible. And this is why they are suppressing the Latin Mass. It's not just about liturgics. It's about theology. You take a child from the time they're baptized until the time they're 20, and you put them in the Latin Mass. Now, they also need proper catechesis and good parenting and all that. But you put them there, and they begin to absorb the dogma of the church just by the architecture and the statues and the icons and the way the priest and the altar servers operate around the altar. They are taught, we are sinners. We are unworthy of God. We were born with original sin. We have concupiscence. We cannot barge into the presence of God. We must humble ourselves. We must purify ourselves. We must fast. We must say the confidior. We must bow. We must genuflect. We must bring our eyes down. We must remain silent. We must listen and attend. It's all there, east and west. There's differences in the Eastern liturgies and in the Roman liturgy, but all those things are in common. And then suddenly, in 1969, we're told, no, 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 we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to put it in the vernacular. We're going to put it in a circle. Father is no longer going to be standing at the altar like it's the, the footstool of God, as we read in the Psalms. He's going to be talking to us over a picnic table. The altar becomes a pulpit and not a place of sacrifice. This is all the old theology, Council of Trent. It's all there. Now, I want to share with you Something that I've read a few times, and it might be new to some people, but this is from Louis Bouillet, and it's in his memoirs. And he talks about the work done in creating the new liturgy in the 1960s. Um, here's a quote. It was Bouillet who had to remedy in extremis a horrible formulation of the new Eucharistic Prayer 2. Eucharistic Prayer 2 is the really short, fast one in the Novus Ordo. From which 
Bugnini even wanted to delete the Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus. And it was he who had to rewrite the text of the new canon that is read in the masses today. One evening on the table of a trattoria, a tavern, in Trastevere, together with the Benedictine liturgist Bernard Bote, with the tormenting thought that everything had to be consigned to the following morning, end quote. What's going on here? This is the famous story where you've heard Eucharistic Prayer 2 was written on the back of a napkin. I don't know if it was necessarily written on the back of a napkin, but it was written in a restaurant the night before. People say, well, Taylor, the, all the liturgies of the Roman Church are in full continuity with tradition. Then why was it written at a restaurant the night before? Eucharistic Prayer 2, the most popular Eucharistic prayer in the Novus Ordo. Why was it written at a restaurant the night before? Come on. I, I'm going to continue to read. But the worst part is when Bouillet recalls the preemptory the Pope wants it that Bugnini used to shut up the members of the commission every time they opposed him. For example, in the dismantling of the liturgy for the dead and the purging of the imprecatory verses from the Psalms and the Divine Office. Pope Paul VI, discussing with Bouillet afterwards about these reforms, quote, that the Pope found himself approving, not being satisfied about them any more than I was. Asked him, why did you all get mired in this reform? And Bouillet replied, because Bugnini kept assuring us that you absolutely wanted it. To which Pope Paul VI responded, but how is this possible? He told me that you were all unanimous in approving it. End quote. Bugnini's lying. Bugnini told the Pope, oh, everybody's unanimous. We, lo we love all these new changes. Totally scrapped the Roman uh, offertory. Changed the Kyrie from ninefold to sixfold. What? Eliminate the prayers at the foot of the altar. Eliminate the last gospel. Write new Eucharistic prayers. Bugnini's telling Paul VI, well, everybody loves it. Unanimous. It's awesome. Do it. Meanwhile, people who are working on it, like, I don't know, this is going too far. He says, well, the Pope wants it. Pope wants it. Pope wants it. Do it, do it, do it. This is deceitful. Now, people will say, well, yeah, but Taylor, I mean, Novus Ordo is valid, so uh, it's legit. It's just as legit. Father Dave Nix has a good, I hope he doesn't mind me repeating this, he has a good analogy. What if someone came to you and said, hey, how's your marriage going? Thank you, Elizabeth, for the super chat. Someone said, hey, how's your marriage going? And you said, well, it's valid. Yeah, but I mean, how are things going? Well, it's valid, so it's all good. Well, how's your marriage? It's valid. I told you it's valid. It has to be good. You see, that's that's kind of, if someone said that to you, you'd be like, hmm, their marriage sounds like it's not in the best place. If your immediate response is, well, it's valid. It's like the, the lowest bar possible on how things are going. It's valid. You see, something being valid doesn't mean that it's excellent. Yes, is it valid? Yes, does the sacrifice happen? Yes. If there's a true intent and the proper words are said and there's actual wheat bread and grape wine, all the minimal features there, it is valid. But it's sort of like a diamond. I think I've used this analogy before with you here on the podcast. By the way, if you're enjoying this podcast, I'll take the moment now to say it. Please like it. Give the thumbs up. Please share it on Facebook and Twitter. And if you're new, please subscribe. Hit the subscribe button and hit the bell on to receive notifications. And of course, most of you, 80% of you are watching this on a tablet or a phone. Please go into your settings and turn notifications on for YouTube. You'll be notified every time I go live. So it's kind of like the analogy of the diamond I use. Let's say you have a, a beautiful diamond, gorgeous diamond. The diamond is the diamond. But a talented jeweler can create a setting in a ring that can make the diamond sparkle more, gleam more. 
He can even make the bottom base of the diamond. He can make a hole there so that light goes through it. He can maybe even add some other stones or features around it. So when you see that diamond, you go, wow, that is a gorgeous diamond ring. That diamond is beautiful. Now, the diamond doesn't change. The diamond could just be sitting on a counter. The diamond could be set in a, um, a ring made out of tin or out of copper. It would be the same diamond. The diamond is the diamond. But what the jeweler does is he puts it in the setting to magnify the features of the diamond. So to carry the analogy over, the bare minimum for the Eucharist, as defined by Thomas Aquinas, is wheat bread, grape wine, the words of institution, which is the consecration, and proper intent by a Catholic priest, validly ordained. If those things are there, a valid transubstantiation happens. That's the diamond. The diamond is the diamond. But you see, the church in her wisdom, like a prudent jeweler, has prayerfully, through the mind of the saints, created a setting, a ring, that brings out all the glory of that diamond, which is transubstantiation, the Eucharist. And it's fitting, it's proper, that the best fitting, made out of gold or platinum, with stones around it, accessing and highlighting and drawing all the attention to that diamond, is what we want. You see, that's what we want. So traditionally, Gregory the Great says in Rome, we say Kyrie eleison three times for God the Father. Then we say Christe eleison three times for God the Son. And then we say Kyrie eleison three times for God the Holy Spirit. And he says that's unique to Rome. The Greeks say Kyrie eleison repeatedly. But in Rome, we do the, the, the threefold, threefold, threefold. Trinity, Trinity, Trinity. That has been part of our liturgy probably since the apostles, very old. And yet in the Novus Ordo, they dropped it from 333 to 6. What? It's, it's Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Christ of mercy, Christ of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy. Why? Well, they just want the priest to say it and the people to say it. See, it's just about a dialogue, active participation. And they don't think, why was it done ninefold? There's an ancient and reverend tradition about the ninefold Kyrie. Eh, who needs that? Go to sixfold. I think probably some of the most beautiful prayers in the Roman Rite are the Roman Offertory prayers. Yes, I know they're later, but they're gorgeous. They were scrapped. They're gone. Now it has. It's been so long since I even heard it. You know, it's the the Blessed Be God Forever prayers. You know, it's, it's, it's not as powerful. In fact, I'm going to read it to you just in case you're not familiar with these beautiful prayers which are just thrown out. Thrown out. Sad. Listen to this prayer. Receive, this is what the priest says when he, when he gets the, the bread and the wine ready for the consecration. Receive, O Holy Trinity, this oblation which we make to thee in remembrance of the passion, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ, and in honor of the blessed Mary, ever virgin, of blessed John the Baptist, of the holy apostles Peter and Paul, and of these, and he lists the relics that are in the altar, which was required. Now, no one cares. They just put out an Ikea table, picnic table. And there are, I know they do put relics in it, but it's not required like it used to be. And of all the saints, that it may avail to their honor and our salvation, and that they may vouchsafe to intercede for us in heaven, whose memory we now keep on earth, through the same Christ our Lord. Why we want to dump that? It doesn't make any sense. The only reason you would dump that is because Protestants don't like that. The language of sacrifice, the language of the Virgin Mary, Peter and Paul, saints, their merits, that's all. Protestants hate that. Got to dump it. And so you can see when Massimo Fagioli says, 
Well, that theology that undermines the Latin mass, it's got to go. It's got to go. That reveals to you right now in 2021 that the setting for the diamond that had been carefully prepared for 1,500 years or more, that special setting that brought, that brought so much attention to the diamond it was thrown away and replaced with something that has been, in general, detrimental to the faith and the devotion of the Catholic people for the past 50 years. And it's sad. It's really sad. We should mourn. We should mourn. It's truly sad. I'm also going to read um, a quote here from Cardinal Ratzinger. It kind of shows, just like the Jesuits are saying that there was a rupture, it shows that there is a theological rupture. And you might say, well, that's Massimo Fascioli, that's uh, James Martin, that's the liberal Jesuits. Let's not follow them. Let's follow the conservative people who like the Novus Ordo and Vatican II. Well, listen here to Cardinal Ratzinger. He says, speaking of the syllabus of errors by Pius IX, which is a magisterial document, you gotta follow it. He says that the documents of Vatican II are against, are counter the magisterial teaching of Pius IX. Now, let me, let me try to understand this. Pius IX in the 1800s issues a list of errors that you can't hold as a Catholic. All right, it's called the Syllabus of Errors. And then Ratzinger, who becomes Pope Ben XVI, he says that the documents of Vatican II are counter the teaching of Pius IX. Let me read the quote for you. Quote, If one is looking for a global diagnosis of the text of, and he's referring to God in space from Vatican II, one could say that it, along with the text on religious liberty and world religions, is a revision of, of the syllabus of Pius the Ninth, a kind of counter syllabus. I'm going to put this on the screen because you guys are going to say, "Oh, you made that up. You didn't quote it right, Marshall." I'm going to put it on the screen. I've been at this game. I know what y'all going to say. Here it is. Get it all adjusted for you. Here you go. All right, if one is looking for a global diagnosis of the text, God in space, one could say that it, along with the text on religious liberty, which you hear me talk about here on Taylor Marshall Podcast, and world religions, how many times have you heard me read the text of Vatican II on Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, other religions? You hear me talk about it. Ratzinger says, is a revision of the syllabus of Pius IX and a, count, and a kind of counter syllabus. So how can Vatican II counter a previous pope teaching? Never heard a good answer on that. Still waiting. Still waiting. People say, oh, Marshall, somebody did a video countering you on what you said on that. And I go and watch it. And I'm like, they didn't answer it. Show me what Ratzinger is saying here, how that, how that works in the structure of traditional historic Catholicism, Council of Trent, Vatican I. Show me how it is that a council can issue revisions that are counter, not revisions as in clarifying, but that are against what the church taught previously about religious liberty and other religions, etc., that's a problem. That, my friends, is rupture. It's not continuity. It's rupture. Cut. And that's a problem. So what do we need to do? Well, we're in Lent. And if you want to be like the early church, you want to be like the apostles and the early martyrs and the early saints... Guess what we have to do? We have to pray the Psalms. That's right. 
I'm reading these <laughs> these early church fathers, these desert fathers. I'm reading Venerable Bede, History of the English People. I'm reading Gregory the Great, Dialogues. All this early church. And I've been shocked. I was telling a friend this the other day. I'm shocked by how little they reference the Eucharist. Of course, the Eucharist is key. But what they talk about so often, the saints, is reciting the Psalms and fasting. That's, that's I read that in the Eastern Fathers, St. John Climacus. I read this in Venerable Bede. I read this in Gregory the Great. I read this in Jerome. Reciting the Psalms every day or at least every week. Prayer, fasting, penance. And we, in 2021, are lazy and we're complacent and we're spoiled. We live in the greatest luxury right now. I'm in an air-conditioned room. I got electricity. I got my clothes get cleaned every day. I got food down in the fridge. I got a microwave. I mean, it is insane how easy and luxurious our lives are. I mean, your life and my life is probably a step up from the greatest kings and queens of the medieval era. We need to identify with the poor and with the hungry. That is true traditional Catholicism. It can't be, now I might make some people mad here, it can't be checking into the Latin Mass once a week. You need to do that. You hear me say that all the time. But we also need to take up the traditional theology and the traditional practice of praying the Psalms. You can do that by praying the breviary, or you can do that by praying the little office of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Great option for lay people. And drawing close to Christ, living a sacrificial life where you repeatedly tell your passions and your flesh, no, no, but I want a little more ice cream. No, but I want to turn on my internet and look at these pictures. No, but I want to Divorce my spouse and get a new one. No. I want to just eat five meals a day. No. Fasting, penance, temperance. I want to drink more alcohol. No. I want to vape marijuana. No. <laughs> we have to set limits on ourselves. Christ came and told us to live a life. That's why he said it's hard. I mean, it's easy with his grace. His burden is light, but there is a burden that we have to carry. So traditional Catholicism isn't just the traditional Latin Mass. It's the traditional Lent. It's the traditional Catechism. It's the traditional Theology. It's the traditional prayers. What's the traditional prayers, Taylor? The Psalms, 150 Psalms. Get to know them. By the way, I have a document for you that you can listen to on your phone. All 150 Psalms in the English Dewey Rames language. It's awesome. You can listen to the Psalms every single week. 150 every week. That means 52 times a year. You're going to memorize the Psalms. How awesome is that to have a huge chunk of God's word implanted into your soul? If you want to get that document, you can get it at patreon.com. Give it to all the patrons over there. Thank you for everyone who supports this channel. Patreon.com forward slash DR Taylor Marshall. That document so you can listen to 150 Psalms and a bunch of other stuff. We have to return to the way of the fathers. That's how we get saints. Why are there no saints today? It's because people don't mortify the flesh. And sadly, when we worship like this, let me put it back on the screen. Hold up. Boom, boom, boom. When people worship like this, right? This is this is feel good. This is sentimental. 
There is no sense of dread when you walk into the picture on the bottom. When you walk into the picture of the bottom, I'm like, oh, hey, Sally, how you doing? Good. Hey, how was your golf game? Oh, great. Oh, wow. That's good. You're getting better. That's good. How's your niece? Oh, awesome. Yeah, tell her I said hi. You walk into the 1938 picture and it's dread. You're walking into something sacred, bigger than you, vertical, transcendent. And you think, man, I'm little. What is man that thou art mindful of him? The son of man that you look upon him. We are less than the angels. We're below the angels and above the dogs and the horses and the cats. We have a, a rational soul. And we can be elevated to heaven, the beatific vision. But we have to cooperate with grace. Friends, let's pray the Hail Mary for this police officer, traditional Catholic, Eric Talley. Let's pray the Hail Mary for him. And let's pray that we can restore the Roman rite and restore the prayers and the devotions that Jesus Christ, our God and King, deserves. He deserves our best. He deserves whatever we can provide for him as an act of devotion. He deserves that. And that means in worship, in the way we build churches, the way we do liturgy, it also means helping those who are poor, the widow, the orphan, because he's in those people as well. We have to give him our best. And that requires from us, we don't hear this very often in sermons, it requires sacrifice from us. All right, let's pray for Eric Talley and his family. Oremus nomini patris et fidei et spiritus sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu molieribus et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, or pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et ora mortis nostre. Amen. Gloria Patria et Filio, Spiritui Sancto, sicuterat in principio, et nunc et semper, et in secula seculorum. Amen. Fideli manami per misericordium Dei, requiescat in pace. Amen. Yes, please pray for... Uh, Officer Tally's wife and his children. If there's a way that we can support him, we need to support his family if we can, if they need our help. And if there is any fund, please let me know about it. I'd love to to, to promote that and support that as well. Um, let's see. Pray the rosary every day. If you don't pray the rosary, you're not on the team. But Taylor, it takes like 18 minutes. 18 minutes is bare minimum. Let's give God some time. Let's take Our Lady by the hand and say, lead me to Jesus. It's 18 minutes. It's nothing. Pray the rosary every day. You're not on the team. My guess is, I mean, how I was before I started praying the rosary, man, I would say prayers at meals and maybe a little prayer before bed, but the rosary gets you into doing some prayers. It's a good start. It's a good start. Pray the rosary every day. You're not on the team. Read the Bible every day. Read the Psalms. Read the Gospels. We're in Passion Tide. Good Friday is less than two weeks away. Read the Gospel of John. Get the Gospel of John and read it. If you don't like to read it, here on YouTube, on my podcast channel, I read the Gospel of John to you, one chapter at a time. That way you can read it while you're in the car working out. Ingest the Gospel of John. It is the Gospel traditionally read on Good Friday. It is. It has the, in my opinion, the best account, the most moving account of the Passion of Christ for us, to save us. If you like this video and this channel, please hit the like button, thumb up. Please share it on Facebook and Twitter and Parler and Gab, whatever you do. And subscribe if you haven't already subscribed. Hit the bell to be notified. And remember, our Lord Jesus Christ says you're the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. 